The United States maintains its status as a massive global empire and the world's dominant political force in a few different ways. One of those, which is probably the most well-known and the most blatant, is the use of military force, invading foreign countries, overthrowing their own governments, just spending more on the U.S. military than most other countries in the world combined. The United States spends more on its military than the next nine largest militaries combined or the rest of the world combined. So that, that is the most blatant way in which the U.S. empire maintains its hegemony. But an equally important way that is more subtle and might not be as well understood is through economic hegemony and what is essentially a kind of global dictatorship of the dollar. The U.S. dollar is used in the vast majority of international trade, even with countries that have nothing to do with the United States. Bilateral trade between two countries internationally usually involves dollars. Then there is the U.S. dominated financial system. And finally, there is the status of the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency. That is to say that central banks around the world, they hold the vast majority of their foreign exchange reserves in dollars. So if a foreign government wants to deal with a balance of payment issue, if it wants to stabilize its currency, if it needs emergency funding, it often stores those exchange, those foreign exchange reserves in U.S. dollars, which all of this gives the United States an exorbitant privilege. That's a term that's been used for decades, the exorbitant privilege, because the United States is the only country that can print dollars. And yet the U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency and has been since toward the end of World War II in 1944. 44 countries got together in the Bretton Woods Conference and decided to make the U.S. dollar, dollar the global reserve currency. Now, what that means is that the U.S. has enormous power to impose sanctions on countries and lock them out of the international financial system and try to destroy their economies. This is exactly what the U.S. has done to Russia, to Iran, to Venezuela, to Cuba, to Zimbabwe, to Eritrea. There are many countries, the DPRK, that suffer from blockades, sanctions, and being locked out of the international financial system. And the way that the U.S. can do that is largely because of the hegemony of the U.S. dollar. So what that means is that more and more around the world, countries are trying to create alternatives to the U.S. dollar, and they're trying to create new financial architectures, new financial systems, so they can do trade with each other, with other countries, excluding the U.S., and so they can't simply be bullied by the United States that acts as a global dictator and tries to control all international trade, the entire global economy, and by extension, the global political system. Now, in Eurasia, in Asia and, and also elements of Eastern Europe like Russia, we see the emergence of new financial institutions that are trying to create new uh, payment systems and new currencies. I've talked in my analysis about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union that are trying to create a new payment system. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization brings together China, Russia, India, Pakistan, Iran recently joined, many countries in Central Asia, and they're trying to create a new currency and payment system. But today I'm going to be focusing on Latin America. Latin America, for over 10 years now, start, starting in the, the mid-2000s, has also been trying to create its own international financial institutions to help integrate Latin America as an economic bloc and to do trade with countries inside Latin America, excluding the U.S. dollar, because the U.S. empire can use the U.S. dollar and the U.S. dominated international financial institutions to try to weaken countries in the region and isolate them. This is exactly what the U.S. has done to Cuba for over 60 years with an illegal blockade. This is what the U.S. is doing to Venezuela with sanctions and an embargo that prevent Venezuela from exporting its oil and have caused serious, massive economic damage to the Venezuelan economy and the Venezuelan people. So what we see is a renewed attempt in Latin America to create a new currency and develop a new financial architecture. I 
have an article that I wrote about this explaining it all. I'll be discussing this in detail today here in this analysis, but you can find the article with all of the sources in the description below. I have a link to the article if you want to read and get all of the sources that I mention today in this analysis. Now, I'm going to start by briefly summarizing a blueprint, a financial blueprint that was created by an Ecuadorian economist named Andres Arauz. And for people watching the video, you can see a photo of Andres Arauz here. He is an Ecuadorian leftist economist. He previously served as the director of Ecuador's central bank. He also served as the Minister of Knowledge and Human Resources in the former, uh, the government of the former socialist president Rafael Correa in Ecuador when he when he was in pre uh, when he was in office from 2007 until 2017. So Andres Arauz, he is a, an economics expert. He understands very well how financial institutions work and trade works, and. He has been advising the new president-elect of Brazil, Lula da Silva, on how to create a new currency for Latin America and how to create what he calls a, quote, new regional financial architecture. And Andres Arauz wrote an article in Spanish, and I translated it in this article. I'm going to summarize the main points today and explain them. And in this article, he, he discussed ways that Lula da Silva, who will be coming who will be becoming the new president of Brazil on January 1st, 2023. He won the October 30th presidential election, so right now he's president-elect. Lula da Silva is a, a left-wing politician. He previously served as president of Brazil, and he's coming back. And Lula has always been committed to regional integration of Latin America, trying to unite the countries of the region. And he was involved in creating multiple international financial institutions that I'll be talking about today, including the Banco del Sur, which means the Bank of the South. That is a Latin American bank that was created to challenge the U.S.-dominated World Bank and International Monetary Fund. And also, uh, there are institutions of political integration, like the Union of South American Nations, which is called UNASUR. U-N-A-S-U-R, UNASUR. And also, this Ecuadorian economist, Andres Arauz, has called for creating what he calls a Banco Central del Sur, which means the central bank of the South. And in, in, with that Banco Central del Sur, the, uh, the idea is to create a Latin American currency called the Sur, which means South in Spanish. <laughs> and the idea is... is not to create a Euro-style system like in the European Union. The problem with that system is that it benefits the rich, large economies like Germany and France, and it hurts the small economies like in Greece. And it prevents countries in the European Union from having monetary sovereignty. So local governments can't run large deficits in order to fund infrastructure projects and social spending and if, they're, if they have a depression, usually if you're, if you're going through a recession or a depression, the government wants to deficit spend to help, to help revive the economy. But in the Eurozone, that's impossible with countries like Greece because they don't have a sovereign currency, so they can't run a sovereign monetary policy. So the plan for Latin America is not to create a Euro-style currency. The SUR would not be a Euro-style currency. Rather, it would be a currency for the region to do trade among, it, among the countries in the region. That is to say that the vast majority of trade in Latin America between countries, even if they don't involve the United States, the vast majority of trade is still done with the US dollar. So if Brazil wants to trade with Mexico, because each country has their own currencies, the Mexican peso and the Brazilian real, what that means is that usually they end up doing trade that's invoiced in dollars. So in order to cut out the middleman of the U.S. dollar, which always ends up benefiting the hegemony of the U.S. dollar, the U.S. dominated financial system, the U.S. banking sector. Instead, the idea is to use the SUR, the international um, pay, uh, the, the currency in Latin America, as a way to, to settle pay payments, international transactions for trade. So this would be a massive step forward for regional economic integration 
and also simply for challenging the dictatorship of the US dollar. And this Ecuadorian economist, Andres Arauz, in this article that he wrote advising Brazil's president-elect Lula da Silva, he said that the, the ultimate goal is to, quote, harmonize the payment systems of the countries in the region. And then he said, ultimately, what they want to be able to do is, quote, to carry out interbank transferences to any bank inside of the region in real time and from a cell phone. So integrating the economic and banking sectors of the countries in Latin America. Now, in order to understand this a little bit better, before I get into more information about these very ambitious plans for Latin American regional integration, I want to talk a little bit more about the dictatorship of the U.S. dollar, the hegemony of the U.S. dollar. In order to do that, I'm going to read Ella, the highlights of a report that was published by the Federal Reserve that is the U.S. Central Bank, although like many things in the U.S., it's actually partially privatized. But this is the U.S. Central Bank. It's the world's most powerful central bank, the Federal Reserve. And in 2021, it published a report titled The International Role of the U.S. Dollar. You can find links to all of these uh, sources that I cite today in the article at multipolarista.com that is in the description below. The link is in the description below. Now, this report at the Federal Reserve discusses the, quote, preeminent role of the U.S. dollar in the global economy. And later on in the report, they boast that the, the U.S. dollar has a dominance that has remained stable over the past 20 years. And they say the use of the dollar globally over the last two decades suggests a dominant and relatively stable role. So when I say that the U.S. Dom the US dollar is dominant, that is not just my language. That is the language of the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, boasting of the hegemony of the U.S. dollar in the international economy. This graph shows the size of the U.S. economy, its GDP, compared to the percentage of the use, the, the percentage of uh, foreign exchange reserves held by central banks around the world, a percentage of dollars in their reserves. So for people watching, you can see that the U.S. GDP in nominal terms is around 20 percent. In reality, though, if you do purchasing power parity, I'll come back to that in a second, which is a much better, more accurate measurement. The reality is that the U.S. GDP, the U.S. economy represents around 14 or 15 percent of the global economy. But it is true that the U.S. dollar represents around 60 percent of the central bank's foreign exchange reserves in the entire world. So that, that's a testament to just how powerful and hegemonic the U.S. dollar is. The Federal Reserve points out that there is widespread confidence in the U.S. dollar as a store of value and has another graph showing the foreign exchange reserves and the different currencies held around the world. And you can see very clearly that the U.S. dollar is by far the most prominent currency held in foreign exchange reserves by central banks around the world, although it is slightly decreasing over time. In 2000, around 70% of the uh, foreign exchange reserves in the world were, U were U.S. dollars, and now it's around 60%. So it is declining, although it's a very slow decline. And you can see that there also is a significant use of the euro, which is clearly in Europe. And there's a slight increase in the past few years in the use of the Chinese renminbi, also known as the Chinese yuan, and, and it's being held in, in foreign exchange reserves. But anyway, the point is that despite the gradual decline of U.S. dollar hegemony, which I'll be talking about more in a bit, it still is overwhelmingly the most powerful currency in the world. Now, there's another really important graph here that shows this. This is the one most relevant for us today for our discussion. The U.S. dollar is dominant in international transactions and financial markets. And this graph shows the percent of trade that is invoiced in dollars, that is of exports, so international trade between countries by region. And you can see that in every region of the world, excluding Europe, the U.S. dollar is used for the vast majority of trade. In the Americas, 
of exports are invoiced in dollars. That is to say, the U.S. dollar is involved in 96% of trade in the Americas. In Asia, it's a little under 80%. And in the rest of the world, it's around 80%. Europe is the only area where the, the euro is used more for international trade, which obviously makes sense. And then furthermore, the dollar, the Federal Reserve points out that the U.S. dollar is dominant is the dominant currency in international banking. Around 60% of international and foreign, foreign currency liabilities, that's primarily bank deposits, and claims, that is primarily bank loans, are denominated in US dollars. So if you're watching here, this, this graph shows the claims, which means loans mostly. So the, the vast majority of loans issued by foreign banks in a separate currency that is not the currency of the local country is US dollars, around 60%. And in terms of liabilities, which is largely bank deposits, the vast majority of banks around the world that have bank deposits in a foreign currency that is not their national currency, oh, around 60% are US dollars once again. So that explains why the U.S. Federal Reserve boasts in this study that the U.S. dollar is dominant. U.S. dollar dominance has remained stable over the past 20 years. And they also argue in this report, the diminution, diminution of the U.S. dollar status seems unlikely in the near term. Near term challenges to the U.S. dollar's dominance appear limited. In modern history, there has been only one instance of a predominant cur currency switching that was the replacement of the British pound by the dollar. That was uh, in World War I and World War II when the U.S. absorbed the British Empire. But the Federal Reserve acknowledges in this report, however, over a longer horizon, there is more risk of a challenge to the dollar's international status, and some recent developments have the potential to boost the international usage of other currencies. Now, this risk report is from 2021, but one of those recent developments would be the war in Ukraine and Russia telling countries that if they want to buy Russia's gas and oil, they have to do so with the Russian ruble. And furthermore, the rise of China, the, which now has the largest economy in the world, and its currency, which is slowly increasing the, the use of the Chinese yuan or renminbi, which is the same thing basically in the foreign exchange reserves of central banks around the world. In fact, the Federal Reserve acknowledges in this report here, it says Chinese GDP already exceeds U.S. GDP on a purchasing power parity basis, which is what I was talking about earlier. I'm going to come back to that idea in a second. PPP, purchasing power parity, is a much better, more accurate measurement than just nominal terms. And the Federal Reserve acknowledges that the, ch the size of the, the Chinese economy is expected to exceed U.S. GDP, even in nominal terms, in the 2030s. So th I, I just wanted to, to highlight those main points about the dominance of the U.S. dollar, because you need to understand those facts in order to understand why different regions of the world are trying to create alternatives to the U.S. dollar. And then, of course, there's the reality that with the weaponization of sanctions and also the, the, simply the theft of the foreign exchange reserves of foreign countries that the U.S. government has carried out that has pressured countries around the world to try to find alternatives. When I say theft, that's not hyperbole. So, for instance, this was first with Iran. The U.S. government simply seized the Iranian central bank's foreign exchange reserves, the U.S. dollars and euros that were held by Iran's central bank and by the government. And then that's exactly what the U.S. did to Venezuela, the Trump administration. It stole, and also multiple European governments, they stole the foreign exchange reserves of Venezuela, including the Bank of England stole more than $1 billion worth of gold. And then the U.S. did the same thing to the Afghan central bank, stealing its central bank reserves. And then finally, with Russia, with the proxy war in Ukraine and the sanctions imposed, in response to Russia's invasion in February 2022, the U.S. And, and European countries imposed very aggressive sanctions, and then they stole the central bank reserves of Russia. It's it, the central bank reserves uh, 
the foreign exchange reserves that were held in dollars and euros. So that has, this has motivated countries around the world to try to find new ways to do international trade, bypassing the US dollar, and in order to avoid international piracy carried out by the US and Europe, they are creating their own independent financial architecture. So that brings me back to the main topic of discussion today, which is the plans for Latin America. Now, Latin America has massive economic potential. I, I discussed looking at this graph. I'll come back to it for people who are watching. In the 20 years between 1999 and 2019, 96% of trade transactions in in the Americas, all of the Americas were involved US dollars. They were invoiced in the US dollar. So obviously the US makes up a significant part of trade in the Americas as one of the, as the second largest economy in the world. And I point out, looking at the numbers here, this is very important to, to, to understand in terms of the size of the economies that we're talking about. According to a nominal GDP, nominal GDP measurement, the U.S. GDP is around $23 trillion, which is around, in nominal terms, a little over 20% of the size of the global economy. Canada is around $2 trillion. So between the U.S. and Canada, that's about $25 trillion in nominal GDP. And if you use nominal GDP, which again, is just looking at the, the strict terms in US dollars, which is not an accurate measurement, even though economists constantly use this. And I'll talk about what's better in a second. But frequently, the way that nominal GDP is used, they will say that Latin America and the Caribbean all combined, all the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean have around 5.5 trillion in nominal GDP. And then the three largest economies in the region would be Brazil, Mexico and Argentina. And the three of them combined have around uh, two and a half, or, sorry, excuse me, have around three and a half trillion in nominal GDP terms. But again, that is not very accurate. If you only look at nominal terms in terms of US dollars, it seems like the US economy or the North American economy, the US and Canada is five times larger than that of Latin America. But actually a much better term, a much better uh, indicator uh, measurement for the size of the economy is purchasing power parity. What that does is it takes the cost of living and the cost of a basket of goods in each country and measures that for what, as the name suggests, the purchasing power of people in those countries instead of just measuring things strictly in US dollars because in terms of local, the local economy, people in Brazil and Mexico and, and Argentina they're not using U.S. dollars for their local uh, consumption, usually. I mean, there are ex ex some exceptions, but usually they're buying, you know, their food and the things they need to survive with their local currency. So when you m use purchasing power parity to consider the cost of living in each country, then you get a much more accurate measurement. And it shows that the actual size of the, the GDP, the size of the entire economy of Latin America and the Caribbean is around $11.4 trillion. That's to say that it's nearly half the size of the US economy, which is around 23 trillion. So that, that shows that Latin America and the Caribbean has massive economic potential because according to PPP, the US economy represents around 14% of the global economy. And because Latin America and the Caribbean represents around half of that, that means that in terms of the total economy, the size of the global GDP, Latin America represents around 7% of the global GDP, nearly half the US, and the US is the second largest economy. So that shows to say, that goes to say that Latin America has a lot of economic potential. And if you look at the three largest economies in the region, Brazil, if you measure PPP, has an actual economy around the size of 3.4 trillion, Mexico, $2.6 trillion, and Argentina, $1.1 trillion. So also, if you combine the populations of those countries, we're talking about over 400 million people. I mean, if you combine all of Latin America, it's getting close to around a billion. So this is a massive region, and there's a lot of economic potential in the region. And also, you know, I point out in this article that not only in terms of the size of the economy, 
but also in terms of the natural resources, Latin America has oil, it has agriculture, it has minerals, it has basically any natural resource that you could ask for. So there's a lot of economic potential. And this has been recognized by leaders in Latin America, especially anti-imperialists and leftists, socialists in Latin America, who have been trying to create independent financial institutions to challenge the dominance, the dictatorship of the U.S. dollar and hegemony of the U.S. empire. Now, in the, in the 2000s, there was a wave of progressive leftists and even socialist governments in most of the countries in the region. And this led to a, the, a, a movement toward regional integration and the creation of numerous institutions. I, I mentioned some of them earlier, and now I'm going to go in a little more detail, briefly summarizing that history and what these institutions do. Now, for people who don't know, it's very important to understand that the U.S. dominated International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, these institutions were created in the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, toward the end of World War II. That was the same Bretton Woods Conference that decided that the U.S. dollar would be the global reserve currency. However, at that moment, one difference was that in 1944, when the Bretton Woods Conference Agreement was signed, it, the U.S. dollar had to be uh, backed by the gold standard. So there are 44 countries involved in, in the Bretton Woods Conference, and those countries pegged their currencies to the U.S. dollar. But so they had fixed exchange rates, but the U.S. dollar was backed by gold and was supposed to be convertible at the price of $35 for one ounce of gold. That meant that the U.S. government couldn't just print large amounts of dollars in order to pay you know, for balance of payments issues. If it wants to import more, if it wants to spend more abroad on military spending and war, ostensibly, the dollar was supposed to be backed by gold. If the U.S. dollar was going to print, if the U.S. Treasury was going to print dollars, it was supposed to be backed by gold or the Federal Reserve was going to create more currency. It was supposed to be backed by a certain amount of gold. But what happened is because of the U.S. Uh, expenditure in the wars in Korea and then the war in Vietnam, the U.S. was spending much, 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 much more than, than it actually had in terms of gold reserves. So by the 1960s, the U.S. only had a small percentage of the actual gold reserves that it needed for the amount of dollars in the world. So if foreign countries, you know, France, for instance, which was constantly trying to exchange its dollars for gold, Charles de Gaulle was the nationalist leader of France, was very angry at the system. This gets back to this concept of exorbitant privilege. The French accused the U.S. of having exorbitant privilege and criticized the U.S. for this. So countries, some countries were trying to exchange the U.S. dollars for gold. And then the U.S. government recognized that it, it that if there was going to be a kind of bank run, if countries around the world were going to try to exchange for gold, the U.S. didn't have enough gold. It only had a small percentage of the actual gold that it would need for the amount of dollars out there in the world. So what happened in 1968, the U.S. paused the convertibility of dollars into gold in the 1971 in the so-called Nixon shock. Richard Nixon took the U.S. dollar off of gold and it became a freely floating fiat currency, which is what we have today still. However, so that part of Bretton Woods died, but two other important institutions that were created by Bretton Woods still live on. So sometimes people say we live in a post Bretton, world, uh, Bretton Woods world. That's only partially true. You also have the IMF and the World Bank. And the United States has veto power. It dominates these institutions. And I have a separate episode explaining the third world debt crisis in the 1980s and the role of the OPEC oil embargo and rising oil prices and, and the, the increase in U.S. interest rates by the Federal Reserve and the so-called Volcker shock. I have a separate episode about that, which you can find at Multipolarista. Just look up, uh, you know, third world debt crisis and oil war. Um, but anyway, the point is, I don't want to get into that. It's too complicated. But the point is that in the 1980s, because of those problems, countries in Latin America and around the global south, but especially in Latin America, were trapped in unpayable debt. And they went to the IMF to, to have a uh, bailout package in order to stabilize their economies you know, they had massive inflation, their currencies were being undermined, they were running out of foreign exchange reserves. So in order to stabilize their economies and, and 
balance their payments, they took out loans from the IMF. And in order to take out loans from the IMF, the US dominated international fund, monetary fund, it requires countries to impose political conditions, economic policies, neoliberal policies of privatizing state assets, cutting wages, cutting social spending, cutting healthcare, cutting education, and selling off state assets to US corporations. So imposing neoliberal economic policies that serve the interests of US corporations and hurt the local economies in these countries and make them less developed and basically just force them to export raw materials and they can't develop local, local industry and they become trapped in this cycle of dependency where they can't grow their local economies and they can't develop their industry because they, all they do is just export raw materials to the US and then US corporations exploit those raw materials and it's a kind of neo-colonial relationship. That really started in the 1980s and Latin America has consistently for decades been trapped in this cycle of debt to the US dominated IMF and the World Bank. Countries like Mexico, which defaulted in 1982, and then Argentina have multiple times been trapped in these cycles of debt. Argentina still today has $44 billion in debt owed to the IMF, which is basically unpayable. And it's caused a massive economic crisis in Argentina. It's leading to a run on the Argentine currency and a uh, massive inflation crisis. And so this, is, this has happened multiple times. So given that recent history of these neocolonial economic policies, leftist leaders that rose to power in the 2000s in Latin America decided they wanted to create an alternative to challenge the IMF and the World Bank. And this brings us to something that I mentioned earlier, the Banco del Sur, which means the Bank of the South. And what happened? In the 2000s, pretty much every country, every, most of the major countries in Latin America, excluding Colombia, had leftist governments. And what happened in 2007, the leaders of Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Paraguay, they met in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. And for people watching, I have a photo here showing this 2007 meeting and from left to right, not in terms of politics, because they're excluding the leader of Paraguay, who I'll leave out. All the other leaders are leftists. But in terms of direction in the photo from left to right, on the left is the president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa. To the right, of him, um, to, to his left, to our right, is the Bolivian president, Evo Morales. And then it's the president of Argentina, Nestor Kirchner and his wife, who also became president after him, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. So they're, they're, they're known as the Kirchners. And then to the right is Lula da Silva, the president of Brazil. And then to the right is the president of Paraguay, who actually ironically was a right winger, but that's a complicated story anyway. And then to the right, finally, is Hugo Chavez, the revolutionary president of Venezuela. Excluding the leader of Paraguay, they were all leftists, many of them socialists. And so they created this idea. They signed a treaty in 2007 of creating the Banco del Sur, the Bank of the South. However, it didn't really materialize immediately for a variety of reasons. So in 2009, they met together again at a conference that was held in Venezuela called the Africa South America Summit that was trying to integrate South America and Africa and build economic ties. And then in 2009, the leaders of these countries, again, this, we're talking Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, Argentina, Paraguay, and uh, Venezuela. Venezuela, Argentina, Paraguay, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Brazil. So these countries, these leaders of these countries met in Venezuela. And in the, at this time, uh, Paraguay had a leftist president named uh, Fernando Lugo. And they met in Venezuela and they signed an agreement and they said they were going to have $20 billion worth of initial capital for this bank. But that never worked. And I'll explain why. Because there were a series of vicious attacks by the U.S. empire, right-wing coups, overthrows of elected leftist governments. Most of the le le elected leftist governments were overthrown undemocratically. So I'm going to come back to that, that thought in a second. Because... I want to talk about other instruments of regional integration that were created in the same period.
Sometimes people refer to this moment as the so-called pink tide. In Latin America, people don't really use that term. But it, it was there was a wave of leftist governments in the region. And they also created an instrument of political integration that was called UNASUR, the Union of South American Nations. And that is modeled after the African Union, right? So the African Union, not, it's not like the European Union. The African Union does not have a currency. It is a political union, so the, the African continent can resolve any disputes, any political conflicts or even economic disputes they have through a regional institution so they don't have to deal with foreign imperialists like the U.S. or France that colonize them. So Latin America, South America created the Union of South American Nations, UNASUR, U-N-A-S-U-R, and it included pretty much all the countries of South America, although later on, as I mentioned, the U.S.-backed coups and the right-wing regimes, they destabilized that and tried to destroy UNASUR. I'll come back to that in a second. Finally, there were two other very important institutions of regional integration. So the Union of, of South American Nations, UNASUR, was only for South America. So there was also the idea of bringing in not only South America, but also Central America, Mexico, and the Caribbean. So that gives birth to something called the CELAC, C-E-L-A-C, the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States. And that became an alternative to the U.S.-dominated Organization of American States, which was created as a right-wing alliance of anti-communist countries right at the beginning of the first Cold War. And it's always been dominated by the U.S. It's largely funded by the U.S. It's based in Washington. So in order to challenge that, Venezuela, the, the revolutionary leader, Hugo Chavez, he had this vision of working with the countries in the region to create CELAC, bringing together all of the countries of the Americas, excluding the imperialists in the U.S. and Canada. And then finally, this brings us to another economic instrument of integration, which is called the Bolivarian Alliance, the ALBA, A-L-B-A, the ALBA, which also means dawn. And this was created by Venezuela under Hugo Chavez, and Cuba under the, at that leader at that moment still under the leadership of Fidel Castro, and they had the idea of challenging the George Bush administration's attempt to create a neoliberal free so-called free trade agreement for all of the Americas that was going to be called the ALCA A L C A. So they created the ALBA A L B A as an alternative, and it's called the Bolivarian Alliance because it's named after Simón Bolívar, the revolutionary from South America, who general who created an army and waged a, a war, a revolutionary war to overthrow Spanish colonialism, creating the modern day states of Venezuela, Colombia, Bolivia, Ecuador. Uh, Bolivia is named after Simón Bolívar, right? Okay, so the Bolivarian Alliance was an economic alliance bringing together those countries in the region. And at its peak, it included Venezuela, Cuba, uh, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Ecuador, and numerous and Honduras, and then numerous countries in the Caribbean like um, uh, Saint Vincent and the Grenadines and uh, and Grenada. So, at its peak in 2012, the Alba had its own currency, and that currency was created in 2009, and it was called the Sucre. And the Sucre, technically in Spanish, it means the Unified System for Regional Compensation. But actually, it was named after Antonio José de Sucre, who was another South American revolutionary who worked with Simón Bolívar to fight against the Spanish colonialists. So at its peak in 2012, the, the Sucre was used for over $1 billion in bilateral trade in Latin America. And that was largely between Ecuador at that time under the leadership of the socialist president, Rafael Correa, who himself is an economist. He has a PhD in economics, and he was trading largely with you know, Venezuela and other countries. So that was, an, that was the early attempt, starting in 2009, its peak in 2012, a decade ago. That was an early attempt to try to challenge the dictatorship of the U.S. dollar. And if you're watching, you can see the symbol of the Sucre that was used. This is the currency that was used in order to try to get off the dictatorship of the U.S. dollar. But what happened? I mentioned that there was a series of attacks largely led by the U.S. empire. So many of the leftist leaders in the region were overthrown by U.S.-backed coups completely undemocratically, and they all came to power democratically. So in 2009, 
the U.S. backed a right-wing violent military coup in Honduras, overthrowing the elected president, Manuel Zelaya, who had become part of the ALBA. And immediately after the coup, Honduras, the coup regime under U.S. orders, withdrew from the Bolivarian alliance, the ALBA. And then in 2012, there was a soft coup backed by the U.S. against the left-wing president of Paraguay, Fernando Lugo. And then in 2016 and 2018, there were two U.S.-backed political coups in Brazil. In 2016, the left-wing president Dilma Rousseff, who was the successor of Lula da Silva, she was overthrown in a political coup backed by the U.S. In 2018, then Lula da Silva was imprisoned when he was running for president on fake charges. The United Nations has said that they were fake politically motivated charges. And the Brazilian Supreme Court has completely expunged his record and said that they were politically motivated fake charges. And that, that's what led to the installation of the far-right President Jair Bolsonaro. He only came to power in Brazil because of a U.S.-backed coup. And then, of course, you also had the uh, violent U.S.-backed coup in Bolivia in 2019 that overthrew the elected President Evo Morales, a socialist, an indigenous president. And then immediately after the coup, what happened? Bolivia, the coup regime under U.S. orders, withdrew from the ALBA, the Bolivarian Alliance. So at every single stage, the U.S. government has tried to sabotage all of these instruments of regional integration in order to maintain the dictatorship of the U.S. dollar through undemocratic means, through violent coups. And then in 2017, there was basically a kind of internal political coup where, it's a long story, President Correa, a socialist leader, he, his vice president was elected on a left-wing platform claiming he was going to continue the same program. And he did a 180, clearly being bribed by the U.S., clearly working in, with U.S. intelligence. His name is Lenny Moreno. He did a 180. He persecuted and imprisoned leftist Correista politicians in Ecuador who, who were following in the movement created by Correa. That's why they're called Correistas. He imprisoned them, exiled them, removed them from office undemocratically, he did an internal coup, basically, and it's a lot of Ecuadorian politicians have said that he was bribed by the U.S. and blackmailed by the U.S. So then, of course, you, Hugo, uh, Hugo Chavez dies in 2013, and the U.S. government initiates a brutal series of attacks in Venezuela that can you continue to this day. In 2014, the U.S. orchestrates a, an oil crash to crash the commodity prices that were used to fund a lot of these social programs in Latin America. I have a separate episode explaining the U.S. orchestrated oil crash in 2014, working with Venezuela to overproduce oil, to crash the price of oil in the global market, and that hurt Venezuela and Russia and Iran. And then there was a U.S.-backed violent coup attempt in Venezuela in 2014, and then there was a violent U.S.-backed coup attempt again in 2017. Then the U.S. government imposed a series of brutal sanctions on Venezuela, the Obama administration in 2015 declared Venezuela to be a so-called extraordinary threat to the U.S. national security, which is what was used to justify sanctions. And then, of course, you fast forward to Donald Trump. He imposes more and more sanctions. In 2019, he imposes this fake coup, this fake uh, uh, unelected uh, so-called president Juan Guaido, a coup leader who was never elected ever. He never ran in a presidential election. The Trump administration imposed him as so-called interim president and then imposed a full-on Cuba-style embargo. And that's where we are today. So the point is that, why did I go through that history? It's kind of complicated. Why? The point that you want to take away from that is that in the 2000s, at the peak of this progressive leftist uh, wave of, country, of leftist leaders in Latin America, they tried to create institutions of regional integration. Economic integration with institutions like the Bank of the South, the Banco del Sur, and with the Bolivarian Alliance, the ALBA. Political integration with the CELAC, the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, and with the UNASUR, the Union of South American Nations. And at every single stage, the U.S. government tried to sabotage all of those institutions, backing coups. And after every single U.S.-backed coup, the right-wing coup regime, there were 100% of them were all right-wing coup regimes. They were all right wing and they all withdrew from those institutions. Honduras withdrew from the ALBA after the U.S. backed coup. Bolivia withdrew from the ALBA after the U.S. backed coup. And Ecuador after the U.S. backed internal coup. Ecuador kicked out UNASUR, 
The headquarters of, of UNISOR had been in Quito, the capital of Ecuador. They kicked it out. They withdrew from the ALBA as well. And they withdrew from UNASUR. And after the U.S.-backed coup in, in the political coup, in prison, uh, overthrowing Dilma and imprisoning Lula in Brazil, the far-right Bolsonaro regime also withdrew from UNASUR. So at every stage, these right-wing regimes sabotaged all of these institutions. And that explains why the, the, the dream of these leftist leaders, under, especially under the leadership of Hugo Chavez, who was really taking the leadership role in all of this, but also with Correa in Ecuador, the Kirchner's in Argentina, Lula in Brazil, uh, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, Cuba, of course. All of these countries had been trying to push for regional integration, and those dreams were sabotaged by U.S. imperialism. But that brings us to today, and this brings me back to the the final main point of this analysis. The left is back on the rise in Latin America. For the first time in the history of Latin America, at least the modern history, the seven largest countries in the region, that is to say the seven most populous countries with the seven largest countries, uh, largest economies, that is Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, Peru, Venezuela, and Chile, for the first time all have left-wing leaders. Now, in, at, the, at the peak of the, the so-called pink tide, the progressive leftist leaders in the region, Colombia never had a left-wing leader. It was always right-wing. Colombia has never had a left-wing government until this June. The former guerrilla socialist fighter Gustavo Petro, he won the election in June and he entered in August. He is Colombia's only first ever left-wing president. And he is a Bolivarian. He follows in the footsteps of Simón Bolívar. He has a portrait of Simón Bolívar in the presidential palace. He, at his inauguration in August in Colombia and Bogotá, he demanded that the sword of Bolívar be taken symbolically on stage, and so he could have it. So he put on stage so he could have it for his inauguration. So what that means is that, and also in Peru, in Peru, the uh, there was a left-wing leader for the first time really in many years, and. His name is Pedro Castillo. And the point is that all of these leaders are now, they're committed to regional integration. Chile has like a, a center-left liberal president who's not very good. And he's not really, he's the weakest link of all of those leaders. He's the least committed to regional integration. His name is Gabriel Boric. And Mexico, for the first time in decades, in over 50 years, has a left-wing president, uh, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, AMLO. He's his. His last names are Lopez Obrador, but people know him as AMLO, his initials AMLO, right? So all of these countries in the region now have left-wing leaders who are committed to regional integration. Well, Brazil, of course, it's going to be on January 1st. Lula da Silva, the former leftist president, he won the October 30th election. And on January 1st, 2023, he becomes president. Right now, he's president-elect. And he's already making plans to try to coordinate with the other left-wing governments in the region to revive these instruments of regional inter integration that I was talking about, like the Bank of the South, UNASUR, and uh, CELAC. So this brings me back finally to the main point today, which was about this proposal that has been launched by this Ecuadorian economist named Andres Arauz. I summarized the main points of that at the beginning of this episode. The reason I wanted to go into so much detail is I want people to have a, a deep understanding of why this is important. It's a, and, and not only to understand how the US dollar has a global dictatorship and dominates much of the global economy, but how the me mechanisms work, how the mechanics work, and how these institutions can challenge the US dollar. So this, this brings me back to Andres Arauz. Andres Arauz is a leftist leader in Ecuador, and he also is an economist. So if people who are watching, I have a photo here. On the left of the photo is Rafael Correa. He is the socialist former president of Ecuador. He governed from 2007 until 2017. He is a PhD in economics, so he is a brilliant economics expert. And then on the right of the photo is Andres Arauz. He served as the director of the central bank under Correa, and he also served as 
minister of knowledge and human talent. And he also is finishing his PhD in economics. So both of these guys are socialists, they're leftists, and they're also trained economists with PhDs. They really know what they're doing. And Andres Arauz was the presidential candidate in the 2021 elections in Ecuador, following in the, the footsteps of Correa and his movement Correismo, also known as the Citizens' Revolution. And Andres Arauz, he won the first round of the election in February in Ecuador in a landslide. I was there. But he lost the second round to the right-wing corrupt banker president, Guillermo Lasso. And Andres Arauz got around 48% of the vote, whereas Guillermo Lasso got around 52% of the vote. So it was kind of close. Not, not super close, but it was kind of close. Um, Andres Arauz did very well, but... He was defeated by this guy, Guillermo Lasso. I talked about him in another uh, video and podcast about Ecuador that I recently did about corruption in Ecuador. Guillermo Lasso, the current right-wing president of Ecuador, is cartoonishly, notoriously corrupt, extremely corrupt. He made millions of dollars as a banker by helping to destroy the economy in a financial crash in 1998, 1999, in the uh, so-called Feriado Bancario. And he's notorious in the country. He has dozens of, of U.S.-based properties in Florida, millions of dollars worth of properties. He's very corrupt. So anyway, the point is that Andres Arauz is a leftist leader in Ecuador. He's also involved in numerous institutions in Latin America that are part of kind of left-wing struggle, including he was a co-founder of something called the Grupo de Puebla. The Grupo de Puebla is a political forum that brings together left-wing forces in Latin America. And you can see here at their website that one of the co-founders is Andres Arauz and also the current left-wing uh, president of Bolivia, Luis Arce. And I should point out, he is also an economist. He's a socialist from the Movement Towards Socialism Party, and he's an economist. So what's interesting about these leftist leaders in Latin America is they are trained economists. They have PhDs in economics. They know what they're doing. They understand that neoliberal capitalist economics is doomed to fail them. It always, the point of neoliberal capitalist economics is it wants these, country, these countries in Latin America to be economically dependent on the U.S., on the U.S. dollar. They can't develop local industry because all they do is just export raw materials. That's what neoliberal economics says. That's what neoclassical economics says with so-called comparative advantage. If you read an economics textbook, they always say comparative advantage, you know, David Ricardo, uh, you know, rope and, and, and uh, te or textiles and, and wine and no, I mean, whatever. Like it's that neoliberal classical economics is pseudoscience. And it tells countries in the global South that they should never develop local industry. They should simply export raw materials and produce textiles and never develop advanced technology and advanced uh, industry. So anyway, the point is that Andres Arauz, he's a, this Ecuadorian leftist economist. He's also involved with this group, the Grupo de Puebla, and he's also involved in other left-wing groups like the Progressive International. He's a leader in, in both of these groups. So now that brings me to uh, Lula da Silva. Lula da Silva is the president-elect of Brazil he won the October 30th election, and in his presidential campaign, during his presidential campaign, Lula promised to create a Latin American currency. I have a separate video and podcast and article explaining this, and I will link to it in the description below. There's a video I did about Lula's promise to challenge the dictatorship of the U.S. dollar, and Lula said in a rally in May, he said, if I win we're going to create a Latin American currency to end the dependency on the U.S. dollar. And he said it's going to be called the Sur, the South. So Lula, now that he's president-elect coming in on January 1st, now it's the real deal. He's on the verge of entering office in the largest country in Latin America, Brazil, with the largest population and the largest economy. So now is time to make real plans. And this brings me to the blueprint that Andres Arauz, the Ecuadorian economist, wrote. And he published this at a Latin American website called Nodal. And 
the uh, the article is called Lula's victory opens a window uh, um, with an with a unique opportunity for UNASUR. So I translated this article, and you can find it in the link below, and the, the link in the description below. I translated it and explained all of this in an article at multipolarista.com, and I will link to it in the description below. Now, I'm just going to read a few main points because I've already summarized the kind of main points of this today. So this, this is just all just for people who just to, I can summarize it again so you can understand how the, how the, me the mechanisms and mechanics of this would work. So in this article explaining the blueprint for what Latin America's plan is to get off the U.S. dollar, Andres Arauz wrote, quote, the goal on January 1st, 2023, in the inauguration of Lula, the treaties should be signed for the new UNASUR. So he's saying that the other leaders in Latin America and South America that had been part of UNASUR, the left wing leaders that created UNASUR, the right wing leaders in the region had withdrawn from UNASUR. So on the day of inauguration, they should all be in Brazil and they should meet with Lula and they should sign the treaty to revive UNASUR. At the same time, he said, they also should be once again reviving the Banco del Sur, the Bank of the South, and they should sign a treaty founding the so-called Banco Central del Sur, the, bank, the central bank of the South. And using that central bank of the South, they can create the regional currency, the Sur. So Andres Arauz is advising uh, Lula to do this as soon as he can, as soon as possible, literally on day one if he can. And I should point out that Lula da Silva himself has, is also part of the Progressive International and, and has worked with the, the Grupo de Puebla. And Andres Arauz is a founding member of both of these groups, a leader of both of them. So that's to say that it's very likely that Andres Arauz, the Ecuadorian economist, will likely serve as an advisor to Lula. And Lula, in fact, wrote an article in 2020 that was published at the Progressive International, and it's called For a Multipolar World. And he talks about why Lula da Silva, the, the president-elect of Brazil, talked about why it's so important to build a multipolar world. He himself was one of the co-founders of the BRIC system, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. So he understands the importance of challenging U.S. unipolarity. And so Andres Arauz, in this blueprint he wrote, he emphasized that this should be done as soon as possible, immediately. And he said the goal, as I said earlier, I'm going to read this quote again. The goal is to, quote, harmonize the payment systems of UNASUR to carry out interbank transferences to any bank inside of the region in real time and from a cell phone. Arauz stressed that this should, be ha this should happen very soon. And the, the, the window of, political window of opportunity is in 2023 between January and September, because in September 2023, there are going to be primary elections in Argentina and the right wing could win. And the right wing in Latin America universally is all much more pro-U.S. and much and all supports neoliberal economics, right wing economics. And they all oppose these projects of regional integration, of trying to create a new currency. They all just believe that the, the dictatorship of the U.S. dollar should continue perpetually. So Andres Arau said, we cannot give up this historic window of opportunity. He said, progressive presidents must create an immediate channel of communication between each other. The political will is there. There is no time to lose. He calls for creating a new regional financial architecture, which could also help to provide a breather for Argentina. Now, at the same time, Arauz emphasized that Latin America has to reject the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. He has repeatedly called for that. This is the institution that I talked about, dominated by the U.S., that has trapped Latin America in unpayable, odious debt for decades. Argentina is still trapped in that unpayable, odious debt. He said that Latin America needs to work together with Africa, so calling for South-South cooperation. They need to work together to take, quote, Collective, collective action to retroactively nullify the illegal surcharges of the IMF. Now, IMF surcharges are extra interest payments that are 
imposed on borrowing countries that have very large debts. So just as, you know, in, in U.S. banks or other banks, if you like have like an overdrafting, if you, if you, uh, you know, pay for something or write a check for something and it's more than in your account, you're going to be hit with an overdrafting fee. These are these kinds of hidden fees that the IMF has. So the more indebted a country is, the more pounds of flesh the IMF demands in interest from those countries and fees from those countries. So it's just a way of just further trapping these countries in unpayable debt. So the IMF can impose neoliberal so-called structural adjustment packages, forcing countries in Latin America to cut the minimum wage, to cut education, to cut health care, to privatize everything and sell it off to U.S. corporations. So what he's saying here is we need to challenge the IMF and say we are not going to pay these surcharges. We are not going to pay these illegal fees that, is tra that are trapping us in debt. And he said, if, Arau said, if necessary, Latin America and Africa should work together and propose a resolution in the United Nations General Assembly challenging the IMF. He also said that they should impose measures to try to prevent capital flight to the United States because what happens is when left-wing leaders come to power democratically in Latin America, all these right-wing oligarchs, the millionaire elites, they try to send all of their wealth offshore to U.S. banks. And he said well, they need to have some kind of capital controls for the region. He also advised Lula himself, Arauz advised Lula, to undo the de facto privatization of the central bank that was carried out by the current far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, and re-articulate the Central Bank of Brazil in the line of development, integration, and democracy. Arau said, it is very difficult to be able to meet the demands of eradicating hunger and the reindustrialization the Brazilian people need if he has a central bank permanently boycotting that program. He points out that the central bank in Colombia has been trying to oppose the reforms of the new president, Gustavo Petro. But Arauz, the Ecuadorian economist, he pointed out that this wave of regional integration cannot remain only at the level of presidents. It should be a true integration of the peoples. This implies profound participation of the social movements of all of the region, but above all, immediate and tangible benefits for the citizenry. So he's saying that this is not just something between states. It also needs to bring in the social movements of the countries in Latin America. And he, st he stresses, as opposed to the European Union, which always benefits the rich countries and large countries and hurts the, sm the small countries, as opposed to the European Union, this strategy of economic integration of Latin America, he said it must give preferential treatment to the smallest countries in the region. So understanding that the EU, the problem with the EU is that it hurts the small countries and benefits Germany and France. Instead, this system should benefit all countries and give preferential treatment to small countries in Latin America, like in Central America, like Uruguay, Paraguay, like the Caribbean. So he, he he's also, uh, he points out that the leadership of Lula is very important in this because President Lula, President-elect Lula of Brazil, has always been committed to regional integration and integration of, of the global south through the BRIC system. And Lula understands that, that he is a, a link, that he can help unite the more revolutionary socialist leaders of the region, like in Venezuela and Cuba and Nicaragua, with the more kind of center-left progressive presidents like AMLO in Mexico and uh, in Argentina. I mean... Fernandez is not really that left wing, but his vice president, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, and also, you know, um, Gustavo Petro in Colombia. So this is this is an important step in this. I mean, the key player is is Lula and Brazil is the largest country. It has the largest economy. And Andres Arauz, the Ecuadorian economist and leftist leader, he, he's the most likely next pres, uh, president of Ecuador. He also proposed a few interesting ideas that he had. One, he says he proposed a massive program of student exchange. So young students in Latin America in pu public education programs, they can do study abroad in other countries in Latin America and help to build links between countries in Latin America. 
He said the goal should be a million young students studying abroad in 2023. He said this will be a motor of integration. He also called for uh, musicians, writers, and poets to have a contest to create a hymn for UNASUR. So they really are, they're, they're serious about unifying Latin America and creating a national, uh, an international hymn for the region. And Arau said that Latin America should appoint someone as a plenipotentiary ambassador for regional integration. A plenipotentiary ambassador has the authority to, to, to sign treaties and carry out agreements even without Lula being, without the necessary necessity of Lula being there in, in person. So this blueprint is very ambitious. It shows Latin American leftists, they have a clear, tangible plan for how to challenge the dictatorship of the U.S. dollar, for how to unite the region as an economic power and a political power, because in his blueprint, Arauz, the Ecuadorian leftist leader, he pointed out that not only should we economically unify, we should have more political influence on the world stage. This is part of building a multipolar world. Latin America and the Caribbean is part. It is a pole in that multipolar world. And he said the countries of UNASUR should demand a collective position at the table of the G20, which the African Union is on the verge of doing. So Latin America, through institutions like UNASUR, should become a new instrument of regional integration. And on the and not only in the economic uh, stage, not only should they be, become a, a block, on the political stage, they should start becoming a new pole in this multipolar world. It's a very exciting time in Latin America. And now with Brazil, the largest country coming back to the left, there are very serious possibilities for the country to unite economically, challenging the hegemony of the US dollar, the IMF and the World Bank, and creating a new pole in this multipolar world. I know this was a very long episode, but I really wanted to explain why this is important, how it works, the nuts and bolts, how the dictatorship of the U.S. dollar works, why it's important to develop alternatives to the IMF and the World Bank with U.S. sanctions. And, you know, this I didn't mention the SWIFT financial uh, messaging system in which the U.S. government can basically cut off banks in countries like Iran and Russia and Venezuela from doing business with other country with other banks doing transactions. So Latin America, along with Asia, they're leading the way in creating a new international financial architecture to democratize the international economy, to challenge the dictatorship of the U.S. dollar, and ultimately to undermine the U.S. Uh, imperial dictatorship, the unipolar hegemony that the U.S. has exercised for decades, and to create a true multipolar world which, with much more democratic institutions and regional institu institutions that will help these countries actually develop lift people out of poverty, create industry, create jobs, advance education, create technology. That's what Latin America is serious about doing. They don't want to be resource colonies just exporting raw materials to the imperial core. They are serious about being a new pole in this multipolar world. And that's why I spent so much time reporting on this. All of the sources that I cited and more information can be found in the article that I wrote at multipolarista.com. I have a link to that in the description below. This reporting that I do is completely independent. I have no big back backers. I have no institutional sponsors. So if you want to help sponsor, fund, uh, support the journalism that I do and the analysis that I do here, you can go to multipolarista.com slash support. And the best way is you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash multipolarista. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I have a link to that below. And you could you should subscribe to my channel, please. If you're listening to this as a podcast, because all my videos are also podcasts, please subscribe to SoundCloud or whatever podcasting pro, uh, program it is, application it is. And I will be back very soon with more analysis of geopolitics and economics and empire. I'm Ben Norton. Thanks a lot for joining me. I'll see you next time.